Hey everybody, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I have with me Darren Gerflinger. He's the superintendent of the Van Meter Schools in Van Meter, Iowa, and he's a longtime friend. Darren, thanks for being with me. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of us. Absolutely. So uh, let's start by telling us a little bit about the Van Meter Community School District. Uh, who do you serve? Um, where are you? You know, what's your learning model? Yeah, sure. So small, small, relatively small school, growing district uh, in our state, but we're just under a thousand students located uh, just west of uh, West Des Moines and Waukee uh, in Dallas County. Dallas County is the third fastest growing county in the in the United States. Um, so it's you know so we're growing. I, I've been here 11 years. Um, we've gone from 600 students to just under a thousand, uh, but we've tried to hold on to kind of that small school uh, mindset. Um, so we used to be a two section school. Now we're a four and sometimes five section school. And our, our mission really, um, for the whole time that, that I've been here, but I think we've kind of, uh, been able to, to kind of narrow it down, even though it's going to sound kind of broad is to personalize learning for each student's success today and tomorrow, because that, that's, that can include a lot of components. Um, but we've, we've been a one-to-one -one school for, uh, well, for 11 years, uh, where every kid gets a device. Um, that was six through 12 for the first eight or nine years, but, but basically for about the next or last 10 years, roughly, uh, all of our kids have had access to it, to a device, um, with where we're located at. I mean, we, we are, uh, uh, there's not a lot of diversity in our school. Uh, you know, um, and honestly, we're pretty low SES, fairly affluent community. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a good place. It's a good place to be. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, but mostly I think it's because our community has has embraced, um, you know, trying to achieve at a high level, but but being willing to uh, do new and different things um, that maybe others aren't as willing to try, and and um, I think what we've been able to do is to continue to perform at a high and actually uh, in, improve some of our um, you know student learning um, scores on some of the more traditional uh, measurements that we use. So, Darren, you know, Van Meter started as a sort of small town Iowa school district to the west of Des Moines over the last decade or so. You all have grown rapidly. You still have a little bit of that small town feel in the community, which yeah, is yeah. nice. Um, but you've long been one of the most innovative districts in Iowa, and everybody just kind of recognizes that. So. Tell us a little bit about moving that very student-centered and action-oriented learning model into remote instruction. What did that look like for Van Meter? Yeah, so um, just to give you, I mean, everybody was kind of in a similar situation, but um, in Iowa, it, it, the way it played out, the week before kind of all this, um, all these changes started taking place is when most Iowa schools or many Iowa schools go on spring break. So I was actually on spring break with my family when, you know, things started shutting down. We were in Puerto Rico, actually. We've got a nice little spot we like to go to down there. And, you know, you could quickly see that things were changing. And so we, you know, we got back home, fortunately, on a Thursday. So it would have been the 18th or something like that. And we set up a meeting with our staff on on Sunday night, and I've actually got my notes to kind of to kind of help help me think through the discussion. But it was on Sunday night, March 22nd. We had a big uh, virtual meeting with all of our staff, and 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 really we we out we we just this is there was at that point no guidance from our state. Um, you know, nobody really knew what was going to happen. Um, they you know the guidance was you need to shut your school down. And that was about it. And so we said, well, we're not stopping, you know, and I, and I talked to you there just as, as before we started recording that, you know, we, we talked to our staff and, and not knowing it, but all the things we'd been doing around, um, you know, collaboration and using technology and, and um, project based learning and, and really trying to get kids thinking at, at higher levels um, in a more personalized approach, you know, um, still focusing on standards but um, and, and competencies and trying to embed those uh, within the learning standards, but really thinking more big idea and, and, and giving kids ownership. I mean, all those things we've been doing 
really, I think, prepared us pretty well um, to transition into a remote learning environment. And, and what we told our teachers is pretty simple. Focus on power standards. You know, less is more. Um, most of it's going to be asynchronous. But, you know, if you, if you need to uh, be, you know, have synchronous things, you, you clearly can do that. So support is needed. Um, and then these three things, be flexible, supportive, and available, because ultimately the relationships are still, you know, we're at the core of everything we do and, and to really kind of focus on that. And, and we just said, do what you can do, basically. I mean, that was kind of the, that was kind of the message. And our, and our teachers, um, I, I think we kind of found, we kind of found two fronts. Uh, we had a lot of our teachers that were doing a lot of great things instructionally you know, prior, you know, in a more, in a more traditional classroom, but in a personalized approach. So, you know, a lot of small group instruction and then kids working on, you know, other things kind of within their classroom. So we did a really good job. And I would say that was more of an elementary thing. Like that's where our elementary is really good at. And then our secondary people were really good at thinking of bigger picture power standards and having stuff online already for kids to be able to access because we, we'd kind of operated in a, we used a flex mod schedule. So we'd kind of had a blended learning approach anyway. And so we had kids, you know, that could access um, courses and, and online learning opportunities prior to all this. So what we found is once we were able to get those two groups of people together, even though we're all in one building, you know, you're still kind of operating as two separate buildings. Um, within I would say within a couple of weeks, we really saw it start to take off. And then, so we, so that was on that, that first week, that was the communication. Well, then the state came out and, you know, kind of said, basically, you can do a, a voluntary approach where, you know, you can choose to go to school if you want, or you can require. So we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, but the, so they gave us some guidance, but we really didn't change much other than we, we said elementary could remain voluntary. Um, but secondary was going to be required, um, mostly because um, it, we just felt like it would um, bring that, our, our students would see more value in doing the work, kind of, I guess, was the thinking. I mean, we, we've operated in a competency-based approach to where they could have done it later, but we, we wanted to try to do as much as we could to keep kids at a, a relatively similar pace, I guess, if you will, even though it's, you know, they could still operate in their own times and all that. Um, and then kind of within those between or as that stuff's going on, we're, we're pretty fortunate. We've got a gal that I know, you know, really well that works for our district. Her name's Shannon Miller. Um, she was building uh, what we call a remote learning website and taking all of the teachers um, uh, courses and, and putting them on this website and well sorry and and that allowed us to uh, have kind of that one-stop shop for our our families and our um, students to be able to go and access you know all of their courses and and all of their um, content um, so those were kind of the that's probably a long answer to the first question but it, it um yeah we just felt really much more prepared than than um you know what we thought we might be yeah, no, and Darren, I think you said to me that you've been, it turns out that you've been preparing yourself to adapt pretty well to sort of this crazy new scenario that happened in the spring. Um, you know, I was talking with uh, the Milwaukee Jewish Day School, which is also a competency-based um, school, and they felt like they had fewer concerns about spring learning loss because they're so used to just taking kids where they are and moving them forward. And so they felt like their transition in the fall was going to be relatively smooth because of that. So how are you thinking about transitioning in the fall and learning loss from spring and summer? Yeah, no, we would agree completely. So uh, though we, though I mentioned we, it was voluntary for our elementary because I think we're probably more worried about our elementary than our secondary from, from that end of it. Um, we had 96%, I think was kind of a, what we, had as our participation rate and you know though we didn't take any assessment to truly be able to you know make some sort of comparison um we just we we believe that because of the relationships that have been built and because some of the tools we've been using that our our 
we're not going to see maybe the dip that others will. I mean, there'll be some dip. I mean, it's you know going to be almost 20 weeks between times they've actually been, um, you know, in a in a more traditional school like schooling, you know, set up, I guess. But um, I think any good school is operating in that modality you're talking about. You're where the kids are is where you know where they are, and we're going to help them, you know, as best we can and provide more supports for those that need it and um, turn the other ones a little more loose. So we feel pretty good where we're at. And we've also, we're doing some stuff this summer too, where um, probably a little differently than we normally have, where um, actually Shannon, as I talked about, has these, I, 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 I think she's calling them summer adventure camps. So kids can kind of have opportunity to do some learning uh, to help with that as well. Yeah. Well, and Darren, I appreciate you saying that other schools are d doing similar things, but I think you have this, wonderful combination of, you know, technology savvy teachers, a competency based approach, a flex mod schedule. Um, you have long had an orientation around personalizing learning. And I think all those just kind of come together in, in ways that probably make you a lot more adaptive than some other folks. Uh, yeah, I can't argue with that. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, um, I, 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 it, I, I, this, situation though you know none of us expected it um i think i think it really what it what it has done is uh, uh you know i guess verified what we've kind of thought all along is that we can probably even be more flexible with what school looks like and and where kids are attending class and and all those types of things uh, we actually use a platform called summit learning at our at our eighth and ninth grade levels and it's been great because it's, we've created a lot of our own content and courses over the years and, and, you know, cause it's cheaper to do that, but it's a lot of hard work and that's already created. So now teachers can focus more on instruction and giving kids what they need because they don't have to mess with building all that stuff. And, but we got a little bit of pushback actually the year before on that platform because of who sponsors it and some of those things that you've, I'm sure read about. And, and, uh, Ironically, we never got any of that pushback as we shifted into this. And I actually had my son's a freshman and he's an he's okay student, not a great student by any means and not super excited about school. But he was just like, yeah, it really wasn't that much different. Other than being at school, the, the content or the, the courses, his main courses were really the same. He said, I just didn't take as much time. I didn't have all the distractions socially and I didn't go from class to class. And so he, he kind of felt like his school day went from six or seven hours to about two hours. And, and when he worked on stuff was whenever it made sense for him. Right. So I think it just, it just kind of affirmed a lot of the stuff we've been trying to do. Yeah, cool. So Darren, one of the things I want to ask you about is I know you have some interesting outside partnerships with some community organizations and businesses and, you know, you know, like hospitals and stuff. So how did you handle some of that over the last couple of months? Well, I mean, I, you know, um, what we've tried to, to develop is opportunities is, is our, I'm going to jump back here a little bit. So we, I kind of think kids can be done with school by the time they're about 15, 16, right? So then those last couple of years, we really try to give kids opportunities to do things outside the school that make sense for them to experience um, learning maybe in a different way so they can decide what it is they want to do after they get done with the actual high school program. So um, you know, we, those obviously became limited a little bit, um, and, and that becomes a challenge because of the, the pandemic itself. But I think um, because we have those solid partnerships and because we are able to um, provide those opportunities, kids find ways to continue to make connections. So, and, and the, the interesting thing to, to me that's happened out of this like we've been doing virtual types of meetings with people. I mean, we've I've hired people from that were a math teacher that was on a missionary um, or a mission uh, on um, in Africa, and she lost her power. And I mean, it was such a vivid memory. And that was ten years ago, I think. So like having these kinds of meetings, like that's not a big deal. Well, now others are willing to have those kinds of meetings, so it's becoming less of a big deal. So they're they're still able to have those experiences even though they're more versatile, which isn't ideal, but you can still get something out of it. So yeah, we just able to continue those. Awesome. So what are you thinking about as you head into fall? 
So particular considerations or challenges? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just all the mitigation stuff, Scott. I mean, that's, you know, I, that's not what I'm an expert in. So we're really relying on the, you know, the CDC and Department of Public Health to really help us think through, um, you know, the physical distancing and, and all those types of things. I mean, conceptually, we understand, but how to make that a reality in a school for bringing all of our kids back, um, because that's, that's clearly the mindset of what Iowa is, and that's for sure going to be the mindset of our community is like they're going to expect their kids to be in the building, and we're going to have things in place. So what, what we're think, trying to think about is like, okay, now how can we continue to do, you know, build upon what we were able to do this spring to make it a, a, a more regular component of every day? And, and what I mean by that is we had small components of it or pockets of it, but like, I, I think our success was, you know, we'll find out, I think more in the fall, but I feel like we did it really well. And that's the feedback we've gotten from family. So why can't we just do this all the time? Like, why does a kid actually need to be at school every day if they don't need to be at school every day? Maybe, you can, you know, there's other things that can happen um, that allow them to continue to learn. So that just, that's more of where we're at, I think, is how do we build upon this? You know, in every crisis situation, you know, how, how can you get better? You know, so looking at it as an opportunity to improve our system. Um, but with all that being said, I mean, like I've mentioned earlier, the relationships are the core of what we do. And, you know, being able to build those relationships, it's easier to do face to face physically in the, in the same area. So, you know, that's still going to be a big part of what we're doing. But I just anticipate us um, continuing to be flexible in, in how we determine what the learning environment or where the learning environment is and what it looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, big shout out to Van Meter for all the great work you're doing there. Darren, thanks for your time today. It's great to see you again. Yeah, it's great seeing you and you're, you're welcome to come back anytime. <laughs> I'd love to. Thanks. All right.